module three, expand your network. Things we're going to cover today, listening. Not actually a strong point for the salespeople, I have to confess. <laughs> no, it's not, but it's most important. Talking, they're good. Listening, not so good. And identify the best networking techniques to expand your influence. In our businesses and the service businesses particularly, networking, meeting potential clients is a great source of leads. And uh, we go to a lot of events, uh, I know I certainly do, and it does yield clients. Sometimes it's great, sometimes it's miserable, but it, on balance it's a pretty good way because it's a face-to-face -face right there. And establish credibility and communicate your value. So how we uh, build trust with the client, how we provide the idea that we can help them, very, very important. And finally, we're going to evaluate our online networking methods because this is now a big function of all our businesses. This is going to come out of this module. And the first thing we look at is one of Dale Carnegie's principles, principle number 15 which is let the other person do a great deal of the talking. And what's the issue with salespeople? What do we do too much of? Yeah, we talk, don't we? we we're sitting there enthusiastic, we're excited for the chance, you know, we feel we've got lots of value, we want to convey that value. And if you find yourself sitting there and the only noise you can hear in the room is your voice, shut up. Shut up. I mean, it happens to me too. And I, I start to realize, hang on a minute, I'm doing all the talking. If I'm talking, I'm not selling. That is the basis of it. If I'm doing all the talking, I am not selling. Because I'm not uncovering what they need to do, uh, what they need for their business. So we have to really, particularly salespeople like to talk. We like being with people. We have to rein that in and have very strategic questions, which we ask, and then sit back and shut up, and don't interject, and don't jump over the top of them, and don't interrupt their flow. Let them go. It's hard, but that's where we've got to go. So in the uh, manual, you have uh, some principles there. This is page 3.2. 3.2, we've got some listing principles there. So when we look at this list, we've got one to eight. Just uh, go through that list, have a look at that list, and tell me which ones you think are the most difficult. So we've got eye contact while we're listening, uh, be sensitive to what's not being said, look at the body language, we've got to be patient, don't interrupt, we talked about this before, be empathetic, listen, understand, uh, clarify any uncertainties they've talked about, don't jump to conclusions or make assumptions, keep, keep listening. Uh, really focus on what they're saying and be, be with them. Try to see it from their perspective. So when we look at these eight, which ones do you think are rather challenging for you? Now it's interesting that we did a survey of clients in 2015 and 60% of the clients said it takes between two and five interactions to establish trust with the salesperson. You think about that, two to five. If you're only having one or two, that's a fairly low interactivity rate to build that trust. Right. And what they basically, nearly 90% said that the key to building the strong relationship was the salesperson's listening skills. That they felt they'd been listened to. They felt that their needs had been considered, their situation had been understood, so when we think about that, we've got tremendous capacity here to improve. Now, one of the issues, though, is our listening speed and our speaking speed are different. We can all listen up to around about 600 words per minute. But most people speak 150, 100, 150, 200. So there's a gap between our listening capacity and our speaking capacity. So when they're speaking, We've got all this excess capacity. And what do we do with it? Yeah, we start to go to other places. We start to actually not really listen anymore because we're starting to think about what we're going to say next or we're thinking about something else, some distraction. So we might be actually present and we might be listening, in inverted commas, listening, but are we really listening? 
And this is something we've got to be very careful of. We have to really focus on the client, remove the distractions, and as you mentioned a minute ago in that list of uh, listening skills, what's not being said. If you have that in your mind, how can I listen for what's not being said? That requires a tremendous amount of concentration. So if you have that as your, your main mantra of listening skills, I'm going to listen and listen particularly for what's not being said, your listening capacity is going to go right up. So there are some, there are some steps. These are the listening steps we go through. Now the first one there you see is to ignore. Now you might think, well, salespeople, how could you ignore the client? What do you think? How could we ignore them? You're, you're talking to them, but maybe you're not listening to what they say. You're so busy thinking about what you're going to say. That's right. To try to, your, your pitch, so to speak. Yeah. And particularly people who've got a, a, a canned repertoire of approaches where they say their bit, sometimes without actually any relevance to what the client says. Now, it happens to me when I get phone calls. I get these people trying to sell me things on the phone, usually investments. Often they're coming from the Philippines. They've got a set routine they go through and uh, they say this and then I'm supposed to say this and then they say this and then I'm supposed to say this. I don't follow the plan. <laughs> you know, I don't follow their plan and then they're lost, you know, and well, they don't just. They're sort of mechanical. They've been taught, you know, this, this, this is what you say. So they're actually not even listening to me at all. They are ignoring me. So it does happen. There are sales people. What about the pretend one? What do you think about the pretend? We pretend we're listening. What does that look like? Like them saying, uh, I like green, and you're like, okay, I'll buy it. I'll get you the blue. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Yeah, they, they, they're talking about they want green, and you're just droning on about blue because yeah. you weren't really listening. You're, you're nodding and you're smiling and all that sort of stuff, but inside your head is actually not a lot of uh, reception going on. Yeah. Kind of like when your wife tells you how her day was. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Sorry, scratch that from the. Yeah, that's, that's typical for men, isn't it? What about, this is probably more about the point of selective listening. What do you, Josh, what do you think selective listening means? Um, sort of hearing what you want to hear. Yeah. Mm. What will we be listening for? What do we, you know, we want to hear something, what are we listening for? In this case, perhaps buying signals or yeah. behavior that indicates something in it for me rather than. Yeah. That's right, we're listening. We're listening for the good news. Yeah. We're listening for need, we're listening for capacity to buy, we're listening for budget, we're listening for problems. Right? And we're, they're probably telling us a lot of other things, but we're conveniently ignoring those and just honing in on the one or two things we, we think might be a clue. Then we get to attentive listening. You know, attentive listening, what would that be? What would be the difference between, say, selective and attentive? Kind of hearing everything that they say, not just bits and pieces. Yeah. Well, the tentative is really about concentration, isn't it? It's you're really, well, we have in that expression in English, you know, hanging on their last word type of thing. You're hanging on what they're saying. It means you're really deep into concentration, killing off all the distractions, not allowing yourself to interrupt them and break their flow because you want to hear, you allow them the chance to speak. You're not jumping over the top of them, not finishing their sentences. That's very, very common. Salespeople love to finish the sentence of the client. You're not doing that. You're actually letting them finish their own sentence. You're even putting maybe a little pause after they finish before you go to the next point. Now, there are not too many salespeople who can do that. They don't even wait to the end of the sentence. They want to redirect the conversation. They want to you know, control it. Let the client speak. And then you follow up. That's pro -tender. Now, proactive, proactive would be what? Uh, engaging, listening to what they're saying, processing it, thinking about it, and adding to the conversation. Yeah. If proactive is, I'm really listening to what you're saying, and I'm anticipating the next part of the conversation. So when I come back and add my part to the conversation, I'm talking about what you said, but I've taken it to another level, or I've taken it to another, <coughs> excuse me, another level of complexity. That's proactive listening. I'm anticipating your needs. I'm anticipating where we can take this conversation. 
right? So I'm picking up the threads of where we're going and I'm adding more value to it. Now that is a high level, high level of concentration to be able to do that. But generally speaking, we're all not great. We're not great at listening skills. Dr. Story, how do you feel about taking notes uh, during a meeting? Does, does that help with your listening? Yes, I, I take notes. Uh, I, I definitely take notes. Uh, I find for me, that helps later, particularly when I come to do the proposal. Right, right, your notes. And I go through, and I take detail notes. You know, I take a lot of notes, take little detail notes. So, you know, I'm, I'm listening to them, I'm, I'm making notes as they speak. Yeah. But does that uh, lend itself to any one of these levels? Like, for example, maybe selective if you're taking notes because you're writing down what you want to hear? Well, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to operate in this level, attentive and proactive. So I'm listening to what they're saying, I'm recording it, and then I'm trying to feed back to them something at a response level that's at a higher level. Right? So they've talked about something and I want to talk about an issue or a problem they haven't even thought about yet. Right? I want to take their logical progression to a, a higher step. And that's really gold. You know? If you can anticipate an issue or a problem they have that they haven't fully considered yet and you get them to go, oh, that's a good point. We hadn't, uh, and thought about that. Bingo, that's really gold. That's really gold. But the only way you're going to get to that is you've got to be really, really aware of what they're saying and be attentive. And that's where I find the note taking helps me because I'm clarifying what they're saying. And I, I can look at it too. So I can actually, I can look at the notes as I'm listening and remind myself of what they said and then I can go back and pick up a key point. So one reason we interrupt is because we can't retain it in our brain. For long enough, we worry we're going to forget that thought, lose that, that, that flow, so we jump in with an intervention. Right? And then that upsets their, their conversation. We're going to do a little exercise in a moment called My Favourite Room. It's a listening drill. One of us will, will describe their favourite room. So the questioner is going to ask a whole bunch of questions about your favourite room. And then you're going to tell them the answers. And then we're going to get you to tell us how that went. And then you can tell us how much they remembered. No notes, nothing written down. It's all going to be just listening. We're going to practice pure listening. So you don't actually have the chance this time to take notes and back it up. You've got to try and remember it. Right? So you got the idea. We're going to ask a whole series of questions about the favorite room and go deep and then try and be able to repackage that up and explain to the rest of us about their favorite room. You all good on that? Mm. That's, this is going to practice our listening it's going to be skills, tough right? Notes. Yeah, really, yeah, no notes. It's going to really work on our listening skills and also our questioning skills at the same time. Good idea? Yeah. Okay, let's give that a go. All right? So think about uh, favorite room drill. You have to listen to the other person and then you have to recall and recount what they've told you. So when you're actually in that process of listening, what was different about your listening attitude compared to perhaps your normal listening attitude? Trying to remember. And what did that force you to do with your listening? Teach you to pay attention to detail. Because mm. yeah. you knew you'd have to come and talk about it, right? So it's your, your listening depth went, uh, where do you think your listening depth was? Proactive. Proactive, right? You're probably up here asking some leading questions, digging for a bit more detail about their, their favorite room, right? So this is where we want to be. Up here, not just the tenant, we want to be up in that proactive area so we really get to understand what the client's not saying as well as what they are saying, which is the point of this, which is the point of this exercise, right? So again, it tells us we can do it. It's not that we can't do it, we can do it. But sometimes we forget to do it because we're too immersed in what we want to say. Okay, what our points are going to be. Uh, 3.3 we've talked a little bit about body language let's have let's have a bit of a look at this too you know. um, when you're talking to the client you're watching them hopefully what do you think just make some notes there what would be some symbols or indications or signs that they're actually listening to you and they have an interest. And what will be some signs that actually 
No, they're not really listening to you because they've switched off because what you're talking about is not interesting. So we, what are the body language hints we need to focus on to know whether we're actually getting to this client or not getting this client or capturing their attention or not capturing their attention. And we see them all the time because we're sitting in front of the clients. Just get down what you think they might be. Let's, let's hear a few. Let's start with uh, some of the positives that they're actually taking in what we're talking about. What are some, indi what are some body language indications that the client is actually interested in listening to us? What do you think? They're sitting up straight. They're sitting up straight, yeah. yeah. That's, good. That's a good one, isn't it? Good posture. Yeah, good posture. What's another one, Josh? Well, it seems obvious, but eye contact. Making eye contact, yes. That's right. That's a good one. They're actually listening to you. You can see they're listening to you as they're looking at you. Yeah. What else? Um, touching their face. Or their touching their face, yeah. yeah. Why? Um, it's usually if you see someone touch their face like this, that's a buying signal. They're thinking. So you see that as a positive indicator. Oh yes. Okay. What else? What else have we got? Sitting up straight, eye contact. What else? I have subtle nod. I don't know. You know when they. Yeah, people are nodding. Yeah. That's yeah. A good one. Nodding. Yeah. They're agreeing with what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So That's right. Mm -hmm. What else? Uh, open arms. Open arms, yeah. Right, right. yep. uh, another one is talking with hand gestures. Okay. So it could be maybe they count with their hands or, you know, give me. So there's some arms. animation there, there's right, some energy right, there. Right, right. They're there's not energy. sitting like a, a, you know, yeah. a dead fish. They're actually uh, they're getting a bit engrossed yeah. in what you're saying. It could they're be like involved. tapping on fingers or something yep. like this mm -hmm. kind of thing. So, uh, and then last one I got was uh, looking up while thinking. Ah, yes. People who are. Really processing, right. tend to tend to maybe yeah. touch, touch their, their chin thing. like this, yes. and they look up, Fine thinking signal. about it. Yeah, yeah. I wonder about that. Mm, okay, yeah, maybe we could do that. Yeah. How about the opposite? How about this is not going so well. This is actually danger zone here. I'm doing my best here, but I'm not getting the right vibe from this client. How do I know I'm not getting the right vibe? What am I? What am I seeing that's not looking good for me? Playing with fingers or head. Okay, so they're distracted. And irritated, perhaps. Yeah, nervous twitch or nervous activity. Yeah, like, okay, when's this going to finish? When is this guy going to leave? Now, soon before this is over. Yeah, what else? What do you think, Josh? What's it? Uh, well, sort of, if you're addressing them, you know, looking away when somebody's talking to you or appearing distracted. Yeah, no eye contact. Yeah, their, their attention's not with you. You feel they've, they've removed themselves from your presence by redirecting their energy to another, another location. Yeah, what else? Uh, it could kind of go along with plain stuff, but like either looking at their phone or their watch, especially their watch. Yeah, looking at their watch or their phone. That's a pretty big indicator. They pull out the phone and start doing their email. <laughs> You're talking about that's, that's not very nice, is it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, another one is uh, just negative body posture. Arms folded, close body language, yeah. Uh, unengaged, no mm -hmm. energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but folded arms can also be contemplated. Can be, can be a habit too. Some people feel comfortable that way. Yeah. It's hard, sometimes these these can be hard to interpret, but there are probably other signs that go with it. So it may be one of uh, a collection of signs that tell you this isn't going well. Yeah. The energy. Energy level is part of body language, too, isn't it? Do you, you feel the energy of interest or the energy of Low disinterest? Energy. Yeah. That's one thing a bit of a giveaway. Are there any, like, maybe culturally specific body languages for Japan oh, okay. that we should watch out? That's a good call. No, I yeah, so say it's they, difficult for Japan because they mask everything so much. <laughs> whether they're, you know, happy or sad, you can't tell. You know, it's so full. Uh, but I, I find... Uh, the question and answer process helps me to dig into if we're getting anywhere. Uh, if I ask a question, if I can get some elaboration, then I feel, okay, we might be getting somewhere. But if I get very yes, no, yes, no, yes, no type of answers, I feel, okay, there's a bit of a barrier here. We're not, I haven't built the trust enough yet. Uh, I'm getting very, you know, automatic type of answer without a lot of thought. Um, so I want more detail, I want more insight into the problem, I'm not getting it. Uh, 
So yeah, but it, from a facial expression, I mean, it, people are individuals, so you can't generalize about a whole race, but generally speaking, Japanese tend to be more contained, I find, than foreigners. They tend to not show much on the face compared to foreigners. They have a lot of uh, animation, facial animation, and a lot of energy animation either, even though they might be interested. You know, they're not necessarily showing it culturally. So they're harder to read, I think. Yeah, harder to read. We're going to have a look in a minute now at something which is very, very interesting exercise. This is a, a great communication tool. Absolutely fantastic tool for projecting success with your client. And it's got a, it's got a number of parts to it. It's called the magic formula. And it works like this. You spend 90% of the time talking about an incident, something that happened. Only 5% of the time recommending an action, and then only 5% of the time backing up that recommendation for action with the benefit that will flow as a consequence of that action. So what we're looking for here is you are trying to provide evidence to your client that what you're recommending is good for them. You've done a great job listening to them. You've understood or you're trying to build trust and rapport in the early stage of the conversation. It's where you're trying to get them to open up because they feel, okay, well, you have done this before with others. You've had success. Okay, maybe we can be successful too. Remember, we, we've gone through that process of the setting it up to ask questions. This is another way of setting up how to portray your evidence where you've had work with other clients that tells you that possibly you could do the same for this company. This is a formula of how to package that. Right? So you talk about the client. You talk about, you now you may or may not be able to mention the name of the client, depends. Depends on if there are any uh, non-disclosure agreements or any undertakings that you would not talk about that client company to others. Depends, or you might be able to use the name, it depends. But what you're talking about there is the actual content of the business. So there was a problem. There was some issue for that company, and you found a solution. So in this incident phase here, you're going to talk about what was the issue for the client, and then the solution you came up with. The action is going to be you're going to recommend that this company do the same thing. And then you're going to talk about the benefit that they'll get of taking that action. And that benefit action is at the very last part, but they're very brief. Now, this whole, this whole construct might be one minute. We're not talking half an hour discussion here. This might just be a one minute summation of some evidence you worked on for another company where you had a good result for them. And this is how you package it up. Right? So we're going, to, we're going to plan this here a little bit. I think on the next page here, on page 3.5. You see there we've got uh, the incident, action benefit, incident, action benefit as a structure. So think back to a client you've had, where you've been successful with them, and when you're describing the incident part here, try to include a little bit of emotion somewhere. And by that I mean just saying, well, they had a problem of not getting enough new clients. That's a statement, that's fine. But try and add something a little bit more of the feeling of how that client was tracking, you know, how they were traveling. So you might say something like, yes, our client was under a lot of stress and pressure because their boss was really pushing them on the numbers and they were not getting enough new clients. And this was their dilemma. They needed new clients and my, my client was worried actually about their job. See? Now, I've talked about the issue, which is not enough new clients. I've brought some of the emotion of how that client was feeling, the pressure they were under from their superiors on the numbers, and they were worried about retaining their job. They were worried about keeping, keeping themselves employed. So in that incident, you've got the raw content, but also some feeling. 
could be the other way. The client was really excited about the possibility. Here's a new market uh, they hadn't explored before. Here's an opportunity to access that new market. So they were very, very passionate about the chance. They were very uh, committed to doing it. They're very energetic to do it. They're very excited to do it. Could be emotion, could be positive, or could be negative. But add something about either one of those in there, and then talk about what they should do, and if they do that, what will happen. All clear? Well, Everyone good? Have too many. You don't have too many. You only need one. We're going to practice with one, right? Design one. If you haven't got one, we'll, we'll listen to the others and see if we can come up with some idea for you. Now, it doesn't have to be just your client. Okay. Anyone on the team who's had success with a client, you can make that the example. Right? You can make that the example. All good? Yes. Okay. Okay, let's design the way you go. When you get around to telling this, this story about this client, try and paint a picture of the time, the season, maybe location. It was spring last year, and I was in the client's office in Malanucci, in the boardroom. My client was sitting there telling me that their company was not meeting the numbers because they weren't getting enough new leads and new business. My client was worried. I could see there was a lot of pressure on the client from their superiors. In fact, the client said, they were, they were worried that they were not going to make the numbers and that might have some impact on their own ability to maintain that employment situation. So get a season, get a location, get some emotion in there. In the telling of the story, not just dry facts. Make it real, make it something that the listener can relate to and feel something of the, the tension or something of the excitement of that particular situation. Okay. Don't make it a dry, boring story. Get some life into that story. The incident is storytelling. And we are attracted to storytelling and we're attracted to interesting stories, relevant stories. So this should be an interesting and relevant story for the client. Tell that story briefly. Have some emotion in there, either excitement or fear, right, to make it real and more memorable and more relevant. Action benefit should be tight. We recommend you should do this, and if you do this, you'll get this. So then the last things they hear, having listened to all this detail, is do this, you'll get this, which is very easy for them to understand. But this incident part is development, and people, places, seasons, the things you, the when, where, why, all that sort of stuff, you put that in there. That's the essence of storytelling. So anytime you need to convince a client that you have track record, or there's a reference point with another buyer, this is how you can use it. Very, very effective. Very, very effective. But it's got to be tight. You just can't warble on and blab on for five minutes telling this an incredibly convoluted story people can't remember. It's got to be tight, to the point, but it's got to be rich in detail. Any questions on that so far? It's kind of a feel, felt, found. Kind of. Can be, yes, can be feel, felt, found as well, you know. This is how we, that, that could be, the, the incident could be structured that way. The incident could right. be, when I met the client, they, you know, they felt that maybe um, they weren't going to be able to access new clients very effectively because they, they couldn't find a way through to do that. Well, you know. I understand how, they, how they, they, they felt about that because a lot of our clients have that same issue. But what we've found and what our clients have found is that in fact that's not the case. If they do these things, then they're going to get the right benefits. And I think for you, if you take this action, you'll get the same benefit. So you can, you, that's just another, another layer in the storytelling. We all good? Yes. What are we doing? For most of us, we're getting leads through advertising activities, through promotional activities, through our websites, through business social media, Google AdWords, Yahoo AdWords, Facebook advertising, etc., etc. right? We're trying to direct new buyers to us. Also, we are proactive, 
trying to find new buyers. So we're joining organizations, chambers of commerce, the different industry associations, going out trying to meet new clients. And therefore, we are all doing a lot of networking. It's a vital part of our job as salespeople to try and meet clients. And it's a great way to do it because you can actually have that first initial rapport building start, generate some interest, and then try and go from there. So on page 2.6 in the manual, We've got some guidelines uh, to think about how we can do that. And it starts there, it talks about give value to people, even if there's no particular service required for you. What, what that really means is you've got a service orientation as a salesperson. You may not have anything particular you can help them with, but listen to what they're doing. You might be able to connect them with somebody else you know in your network that could be a client, potential client for them. That's adding value. So your reputation as someone who provides value gets enhanced. That's one way of looking at it, right? And uh, share your unique abilities and knowledge with others. Again, you will have some experiences across industries or sectors or aspects of Japan which you can talk about uh, helping others. They might be looking for accountants. They might be looking for lawyers. They might be looking for uh, some service provider that you may actually, particularly your business, because you cover so many industries that you would actually have knowledge of. And be approachable. Now, be approachable sounds sort of common sense, but sometimes people at networking events don't seem to realize they're networking <coughs> events, and they're actually not very approachable and a bit standoffish. It always amazes me uh, when I go to some events, people are not approachable. So you should be the opposite, of course, because you're in sales. And don't sit together at the same table, uh, spread out, meet new people, be prepared to walk up to people you don't know and say hi. And for a lot of people, that's difficult. They don't know how to walk up to people and say hi. I'm going to practice it in a moment. Uh, and follow up on commitments. If you say you're going to follow up, then follow up. But the trouble is you go to a lot of events, you get the cards, you forget who was what. Do you guys ever write on the cards? Do you ever make a little notation on people's cards to help you remember what it's about? I do A, B, and C on the back. Quick, but I've been well, ABC to, means what? Uh, for me, in the networking class that I've gone to in the past, just said, you know, A is a really hot prospect, someone you want to uh, follow up with immediately. So B A's, would A's be yep. one of those either potential or a connector, you right. know, um, yep. kind of a warm lead, I guess. And C would be just don't waste your time. Just, right. You know, and you being cautious about not doing that. I've been told that you can't write on someone's business card. In front of them. In front of them. Okay. You can write on it, but okay. don't write on the card in front of them. <laughs> so when you get, you know, when you Let collect... Let them see, write a C on there. Well, you get, you're collecting a lot of cards, right? And then you sit down at the event, pull out your cards, and you go through A, B, C, or what you, I try and write the date yeah. and where I met them. Because my diary will tell me. I was at an American Chamber function on this day. I go into my diary, it'll tell me, oh, that was at this hotel or attack or whatever it was, what it was about, right? So I've got the, the detail. I don't need it on the card. I'm not a very good artist. Some people actually draw a little face of the person. I've seen that. They actually, they're pretty good. They can see the face and do a quick, what the face looked like. You know, I'm not that good. <laughs> but I'll write something on the card like follow up. Here's someone I should follow up with. And then I try within a couple of days to do that. As an idea. And uh, third, personal thank you notes. I mean, you know, it depends, I guess, on the conversation. Um, physical notes are very, very powerful. Emails are still very, very good. Um, again, you, you connect people together, introducing influential people together. So, you know, have you met uh, Suzuki-san, you know, or have you met Tanaka-san over here? Put people together, you're helping people to build their networks. You're a connector, which is great. Uh, find out beforehand who will be attending. Now, a lot of uh, organizations in this town will not tell you who's at the event. They won't give out the list. They, don't, they won't give you after the event. They won't give you the list of who attended. Some do, some don't. What I find is good practice is go early. They have everyone's name cards laid out. Everyone is there before they get there to collect them. Be the first there, collect yours, and then see who's at the event. And you will see people in that list that you want to meet. Oh, so-and-so is going to be here. Or so-and-so is already a client. I'll make a point of thanking them or seeing them and saying hello. Right? Do that every time. Go early, 
check while all the cards are there because this, uh, some cases the only way you're going to know uh, who's there. I say show up early, again look your best, look professional of course, bring lots of business cards. I'm amazed I turn up these events and people, oh, I forgot my cards, and I can't get your cards, no. that happens, but well, I've run out of cards. We're in sales, we can't forget them and we cannot run out of them. If you need emergency supplies, stick them in your pockets, have your, your Meishi holder. Right, have I got my Meishi holder here? You look at this, it's a very wide gusset, right? It holds a lot of business cards for a reason. Right? I want to not run out of my own cards, I want to collect lots of their cards. Now, in our case, we have Japanese language and English language. We don't have a bilingual card. And the reason we don't have a bilingual card is because on the back, we have information about the products and services we sell. So one side is the contact information, the other side is a guide to what we do. Because invariably, people will say to me, oh, Dale Carnegie, uh, what do you guys do? At which point, I just pull the card out and I turn it over and I say, there are the things we do. We teach the top four business skills. Leadership, sales, communication, presentation skills. Boom, right there. And I give it to them on that side. I usually don't give them that side. I turn it over and give them that side. Because that's where all the sales stuff is on. It's part of the card. The Japanese card, again, same thing, but more detail, because Japanese tend to want more detail. Right? Foreigners don't want more detail, they want four top things, that's good. Japanese don't want a bunch of uh, short details, want long details. So we have two different cards, but that means I need to carry two sets of cards, which I do. If it's going to be a big event, I'll have in my pockets, I'll have additional cards, backup cards. Or if I've got a bag somewhere, I'll have them in the bag, go and replenish. So, uh, you know, I see people, they come, they come to events with these very stylish, little metal, you know, sort of holds about five cards type of card holder. Obviously never in sales, you know, that's not how we're going to be, we're going to be different. So bring lots of them. And extend target your customers, you know who's coming, look for them. If you don't, then look for the names that are out there and try and see them. I saw a client the other day at an event, had the city for a while. He's got uh, two people on my course, the Alcani course, as a trial. And I'd sent him a note the other day, I said, you know, have you noticed any changes, how these guys are going, this guy won a prize, this guy did this, this guy's missed a couple of classes, you know. And just followed up a little bit, and I saw him and he said, yeah, these are the first two guys, next two guys are coming. I'm gonna send him in twos. Well, that was great, great news to hear that. Oh, that's brilliant, well, well, here we go, so, helps. Now, don't drink or eat, etc. while you're mingling. That's right, we're not there to eat. You know, if it's a, a stand-up event, or uh, Rishoku they call it, standing event, where you've got all the food sort of on the sides, and the speeches are finished, and people are then mingling and networking, and then some are eating, you shouldn't be one of them. Your job, not to eat. Your job, not to drink. Your job is to find people, exchange cards, talk to them, get to know them, understand there's a business opportunity here, and move on and find the next one. So you don't use up all your time on one person, you have a reasonable discussion with that person, and then you go and find the next one. At the end, eat, but not during. That's not your job. Your job is to meet as many people as possible in that period of time. The um, American Chamber Shinyan Kai, the New Year's party, it's a big event, a couple hundred people. It's hard to work that room. You've got no time to eat. Your job, get out there and talk to people. Uh, and don't waste time with non-buyers. Yeah, if you discover uh, that they're actually not someone who's capable of buying, then be pleasant, but be brief. You know, move on, find someone who can buy. Yeah. I, I had as a question for you. I find this is somewhat difficult for me. How to, do I, to truncate? Yes, sir. How to, how to break out? Yes, sir. How do you guys do it? What do you do for breaking away? Yeah, for me, I, I tend to be polite. And I say, hey, this has been great talking to you. Thank you very much. Actually, I, I want to spend some time and meet a few people I don't know today. So thank you and I'll, I'll, I'll see you at the next event. I explain, I'm, I'm here, I want to meet other people as well. And uh, you know, uh, nice chatting with you, but I, need to, I want to meet some other people, so I'm going to move on and meet some other people. No one feels unhappy about that. You know, They know it's a networking event. Right, right. They expect that's what you're there for. They understand, yeah, you want to meet new people, that's good too. So that's how I do it. Anyway, polite, but break it off. Now stand close to the entrance at the start and the end of the event. So that makes 
you know, you, people come into the room, it's good to be at the entrance because the entrance is a very discreet, limited area. You will see who comes through the door. So you'll pick them up as they come on into the room. Good way to grab them because once they get in the room, they tend to spread out. It can be a big room. It's hard to get to people. Get them to the door. And then as we eventually wind it down, go to the door and as people file out, you get the ones you missed on the way in or after the event kicked off. It's not a bad piece of advice too. And then spend two thirds of your time with people you don't know. So people you do know, you greet them, just reignite the relationship, but try and look for the people you've never met and walk up to them. So how do you walk up to people who you don't know? That hold that, hold that one there. We'll come to that in case you got an answer, but I'll, I'm gonna give you my answer. How do you guys do it? How do you front people you don't know? Yeah, and that's right, often people will form groups, circular groups, and it tends to exclude their deep conversation or a conversation. In my case, I, I tend to I tend to have my have my Meshire, my, my card holder with me. And I tend to do things I'll, it doesn't matter if they're in a group circle or not, or individually. I'll walk up and I'll say, may I meet you? And I put out my hand. I say, may I meet you? And I put out my hand. It's very hard to say, buzz off, you know? And then as soon as I, then I'm out with the card. So if they're in a group like that, I'll come up beside them and just touch them on the shoulder and get their attention because they're talking to you and I touch them on their usually left shoulder because I'm right-handed, right? Because I'm going to shake hands. Right, if, they're, if they're there, I'm here, I'm, that's easy for me to shake hands. So on the other side, I've got to go across, it's a bit hard to go across like this. So when I, I touch them and say, oh, hi, may I meet you? They've got to turn around to me now. So they've now broken the group because they've got to shake hands with me. You see what I'm saying? I'm making them twist their body. Right, here's a circle. They've got to twist off the circle and face me because I'm, I'm at a perpendicular to them. I'm at 90 degrees to them. Right? I'm like this, they've got to turn to me. So now I've, got, I've broken them out of the group. I've broken them out of the herd. That's how I do it. I just say, may I meet you? And then I, I, work, then I, I work the rest of the group too, <laughs> immediately as well. I get one and then do, I do, yeah, can I meet you? Can I, I do the whole group, fix them all up. If there are tables, when uh, people are sitting at tables are already sitting down, often Japanese will do that. They don't do any networking. They go to the event, they sit down. They get there, they sit down. They don't want to walk around me, but I go and find them. Hi, may I meet you? And I, hi, may I meet you? Yeah. And then they, you know, da da da, and I get the guy's card, have a little bit of chat. Or even if I'm at uh, one table, I know I've, there's my chair. I've, I've, this is something too, I, at events, uh, if you're going to be in a group, uh, you don't want to work the same table. So we, as a rule, we tend to have the table, we'll put our business card on either the seat or usually take the serviette off the table, put it on the chair, put the card right in front so no one will sit there. It's taken. There's got to be some indication that table's taken because you will work that whole table. But you work that whole table last. So all these other people who are sitting at these other tables, you head over to their tables. And you do the same thing. Hi, may I meet you? You're not even sitting with that group. It doesn't matter. Hi, may I meet you? You work the whole table. They all think, oh, you must be a member of the table because you, everyone meets everyone at the table, of course. You're not, but you work the whole table. Then you're going to find the next table. You work that whole table. And at the end, you go and work your own table because you're going to be sitting there. At least you have a conversation with the people. With the others, you'll only have the chance just to exchange business cards. That's it. And you, you, get, you see someone looks interesting, then you'll have a conversation. So there's some of the things, the techniques that, that, that uh, I use, I find work quite well. Uh, I think we've probably covered up most of the other things that are on the, on the note there. Yeah. Um, I think one thing that's missing on here is yep. uh, try to invite them on either LinkedIn or Facebook. Yep, yep. Tell them that you're going to do that. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. I usually yeah. At, the event, at the event, you don't want to be talking details. That's not the point. You're not going to get into a sales pitch at the event. You might talk a need. You might talk about, we have solutions, but you're not going to go beyond that. What you're looking for is an opportunity to come back later in their office and have a, a detailed business conversation. That's where you want to go with this, right? So we're going to set that up. Right? And we're going to talk a little bit about 
the networking interview in a moment. This is on page uh, 3.7. So this is an idea about how to have a conversation. Now, some people don't know how to do small talk. They just don't know how to do small talk. They don't know how to get a conversation going. They don't know how to warm the person up. But this is a guide. So uh, the first part there, the symbol, is name tag, right? So, you know, hi, great story, uh, pleasure to meet you. What's your name again? And sometimes I'll look at their badge, because the badge is usually on their left side, and so it's hard to read, right? It's usually hard to read. And so you say, you know, I, I, I say, and you are, oh, Sizikson, hi. I, I make that point. I physically look at their, look at their name tag. Oh, Sizikson, great story. Right? So I, I get the name thing knocked off. And smiling, you know, being friendly, smile. So we, we go for the name. Smile. Now, briefcase, as you see here, briefcase is talking about work. What do you do? Who do you work for? You know, what are you doing here? So you're trying to get some idea of what industry they're in, what business they're in. And then the ticket there is basically, you know, well, um, <laughs> why, why are you here today? What brought you to this? What was about this event that attracted you? Or it could be, it could be why, why are you in Japan too? Why are you in Japan or why are you at this event? Could be either. How long have you been in Japan? Why are you here? Da da da. So that part of it. And then uh, the next one is the barrier, the roadblock, which is, you know, uh, you're looking for, so how are things going in your industry? How are things going for your company? I find Japan very challenging. How do you find doing business here? You know, so you're starting to, you're starting to dig for problems. You're starting to dig for trouble. And then the trophy, which is symbolic here of a success. And you might talk about, yeah, we, we've we recently been very fortunate to be able to help uh, some clients out of some really tricky positions they got themselves into and fix some of their problems. You, know? so you, uh, you talk about a client just very briefly, very, very briefly. Then you might say, you know, maybe we could do the same for you. I don't know, but uh, let's get together and find out. So you're, you're going through this process to try to get to, maybe I can help you, I'll get in contact with you and set it up, and then you move on to the next person. So you got the idea how it works? Mm. So let's try it, let's try it. Maybe just close your books for a minute. No, I, just I, I personally I don't allocate. <coughs> An average time per person because it'll vary so much. Yeah, I, I take it by the the response. Okay. If they sound like they're a company who could be a client, then I'll want to dig a bit deeper. But I don't want to chew up all my time on one person. Yeah. So I'll get to a certain point and then I'll close it out. So I'll, I'll get back to you. And I'll move on. So I, I don't have a, an average time per person. Other people, I'll know straight away this person is not going to take me anywhere. Look at their card very carefully. What's their position? Uh, they're not the right person to talk to in this company. So, and if they're very junior, they can't introduce me to the right person either, usually, it's Japan. If they're a senior person, but they're a different segment, then that might work okay. Can they introduce me to the right people? I'll look for that if it's an opportunity. But I'll know, let's look at the card, I have a pretty good idea. Just be pleasant, be nice, but don't waste too much time here because they're not a buyer. And that will that could be that could be very short. You know, it could be a couple of minutes, and others people could be five, ten. Do you go through the whole process uh, with those uh, dead fish, so to speak? Or do you no, no, I don't. Kind of, kind of <coughs> no, I don't. I, if I, I get to, uh, I get to the early stage, of, I realize this is not going to be a, uh, a business conversation in the future. Then I cut it early. I move on because I, I'm either at limited time, lots of people to meet, and I want to work the room. I always have in my mind, work the room. <laughs> that means the whole room, right? And come back with a big wad of cards of which you probably have only two or three, which are really right? yeah. So let's practice it, okay? Let's stand up, and we're gonna meet each other on network. This is a very simple structure, just to give you a, a direction, if you need it, right? You don't necessarily have to follow this exactly, but if you're having trouble getting the conversation to flow, and you need to move it along, 
this is not a bad way to do it. You know, it makes sense, you know. Who are you? What do you do? Um, you know, why are you here? What's in it? How's the business going? Any issues? We've done some great things for people like you. Maybe we can do the same thing for you. Let's get together. So it's got a nice, nice little flow to it. Right? On the next page, uh, we go a bit, we go a bit deeper, I think, on that. This is the appointment power phase. This is on uh, 3.8. So this is where we're going to plan this part a little bit more here. About they've got an issue. We can help, and then we're going to set it up. All right. So the idea here is uh, you've tried to find out what is a sort of barrier to growth or barrier to success for them. You've done similar work for somebody else, and maybe you could do the same thing for them. Let me try and, and organize a time to get together with you, or something like that. So this gives you a little bit more concrete. We did that just on the, you know, standing up and doing that. But this gives you a chance to go back, because that's the key part. I found, for most of you, this part's all pretty good. You know, first part's pretty good. It's getting this part to flow nicely at the end, which is the, the key part. This is really, if you don't get this part right, it doesn't matter how good this part is, you're not going to get the meeting. All right? So just take a few moments. And let's plan out a little bit more about how you're going to approach this last part. Any questions on that? We'll so you pick a key issue, okay? You pick a key issue, and then, okay, well, this is what we've been doing with that. And then how do I get the permission? So what is the key issue? The key issue is not enough clients, not enough awareness, not enough sales, uh, can't recruit enough people, or whatever it might be. Nominate what the key issues. Then, how you are already doing this with somebody else, right? So just nominate the issue. Then, then explain how you're working on this with other similar industries or industry sectors or similar clients, and then how you're going to get into the last part. Really make wrap that last part up. Okay. So let's let's hear it. You've moved the conversation around a key issue of concern for them. What you have been doing with other clients to help, and then smoothly trying to set up the next. Just keep it broad, you know. Yeah, we've had success in fixing that problem. Maybe we could do the same for you. Maybe let me swing by and just see, you know, if there is a possibility of helping. Let me at least show you what we've got, and then you can decide. Yeah. Very low key, no pressure, right? Again, low pressure, low pressure, and sounds casual, you know, and you try and keep the business talk light. Don't go into a sales pitch on your company. The key point here is, you understand they've got an issue, you've seen that issue before with other clients, that's all you've got to say. Then let's get together. Let's keep it, don't get into a mini elevated pitch on the services of the company. Keep it much simpler. Can you give me your example? Yeah, well, I was doing it before with these guys, but I say, like, for example, say um, we're talking about middle management, right? I ask, uh, has the company been growing rapidly? R companies who have rapid growth often have this problem, right? So I say, yeah, well, that rapid growth can be challenging for companies around middle management development because often they're just not quite big enough to have internal training. But the great thing is, we've got these public courses and our clients. They love it. They send one or two people to the public course and they get what they need. Maybe something might work for you. I'm not sure. Let me uh, swing by and just show you what we've got and then you can select if you think there's something interesting uh, and apply it for your company. In the same way these other companies have been able to fix that problem, it may work for you too. How does that sound? Something like that. Right, something like that. Which is what we use. And so we'll talk a little bit now about social media. Now one of the issues about social media is you've probably got people in your organization who are updating this stuff. They're not you. Are you on top of what they're putting on there? And are you vetting what they put on there? Because in organizations, you've got some people who are putting stuff on Facebook, they're putting it on Twitter, they're putting it on LinkedIn, they're putting stuff on Instagram. But you don't even know, because you're busy doing something else. You've got to know how the company's being presented, what your website is looking like, any new things on the website, because if clients are looking at that and you don't know about it, 
then that's a problem. Or there may be great things on there that you need to reference and tell them about that they don't know. But you don't know to do that if you're not aware of what's going on. So you know, if you're not receiving your own company's uh, information to check it, that's a big problem. You should all be getting everything. Or even better, you should be trying to impact what's being fed into that because you've got certain key messages that you want clients to receive, but you may not be in a position to actually do that because someone else has got that job. And they may be putting out there what they think is exciting and interesting, but you may have a different view. So just as a, a heads up, make sure your own profiles are up to date and are really, really humming. Make sure your company's profile, you're aware of it, okay? And make sure it's working for you as well. And be careful about changes, because while you, you're out seeing clients, someone's changing what's going on, and you won't know about it, right? So sometimes for me too, I notice, I, I see something, we send out, my marketing team sends it out, <clears throat> naturally I get a copy, I look at it, I, uh, you know, I press this link, and I notice this, we need to change that, you know? So don't miss the opportunity to work with your marketing side to control the messages that are going out, okay? Something we sometimes forget about, because we think, oh, that's not our job, but actually our job is sales. And we better determine the sales message coming out of the organization. We better be aware of the things we've got on our site so we can reference people to them and appear more helpful. So any questions on that section today? And that's the dilemma. And that's why I have two Facebooks. Yeah, that's what you said. I've got two Facebooks here. Yeah. I've got two Facebook. Two how do you, Facebook. How do you, do you just set it up different email addresses? Or? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I have two. I have a personal, uh, my 20 karate mates. Right. One address, and I have my business one with a thousand plus so people. So when people... Because otherwise, you know, exactly. It gets, Japan, LinkedIn is not established yet for the Japanese market. Western market, yes, foreigners, yes, but Japanese, no. So it's very hard. I, you know, so we use Facebook uh, with promoted ads to try and attack the sort of general populace you know, for awareness. But yes, it is a bit tricky. But my point here is more about knowing what's on your own site, knowing what things have been uploaded, what new videos are now on BAJ TV, knowing you know, what uh, updates are going out to clients so that you're aware of it. Because sometimes you won't even be aware of it. And your clients will be aware of it because they're getting it, but you may not be aware of it. Yeah. I'm not online either because there's only so many hours in the day, right? But my family's online, um, but I don't go online because it seems to be, that's more like the Facebook, you know, in the States for me. Line is more uh, personal, it's not really business oriented, so I don't bother with it. Do you want to sit in this line? Absolutely, yeah. Of course you should. You should. You've got the asset, you know? Yeah. How do you use your own asset? That's a critical thing. You've got a fantastic asset, you don't use it, it's like having no asset. So yeah, you definitely should use it. But just be aware of what's going on. Try and have some input into what messages are being sent out as a sales team, because the marketing people are sending them out. But you've probably got no, no decision making there about what the content is. So you want to close that gap. Have a bit of influence on that and uh, keep yourself on top of it, basically. Right.